morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Bill Silver. I'm the Dean of the School of Business and Economics and also of the Wine Business Institute. Uh, it's great to see you here this morning. Uh, if you look around, you'll see uh, many colleagues that you've met before and some that you haven't met before. If you're observant, you'll notice that there's a centerpiece on your table. Now take a quick look. Some of you have one kind of centerpiece. It would look like some of these. Others of you, and I'm going to ask this table to hold theirs up, have a different centerpiece. <laughs> right. Now, uh, uh, Liz, can you read real quickly what it says on the label there? China cut crystal plastic cups. Crystal. Crystal is the key word here, because we wouldn't want to do anything without fine crystal. And, and then finally, uh, maybe only one or two of you have something that looks like this uh, on your table. Uh, but I suspect this crowd may actually have more of these at their disposal. So uh, I'm going to give you one minute here. Uh, in a prior life, I was an OB professor, and we love doing these types of, of things. Uh, here's the goal. In one minute's time, those of you that have something like this need to get it open and poured so everyone has uh, some of it in one of those things. And some of you are going to need these. And your minute starts now. <laughs> Seven, six, five, four, three, that's fast. Four, three, five, two, one. How do we do? If you have a, a glass filled with uh, something reddish, uh, hold it up. But don't drink from it yet. All right, give yourselves a hand. That's what, outstanding. Now, now, in this fine crystal, we need to let that breathe for a, a few minutes. So, so just set it a, a aside. Uh, it's said that every bottle of wine contains a, a story. And, and so by way of welcome, uh, I brought a few stories here for you that, that I'd like to share. Uh, that slide has my name. I'm Bill Silver. And, and uh, there's a long story here. But the short version of the story, uh, many years ago, before there was gray hair and titles before and after names, uh, I did what many people did, which was you know, have fun, right? So uh, this is a story of a, of a trip to Vermont on a, on a bike ride. And uh, many of you have uh, wonderful places, historic places to go bike riding. Uh, if that's France, it's Tuscany, other places. Uh, we were on one of those rides in, in, in Vermont, which may be known for its fall foliage, not necessarily for its wine. Uh, but in the United States, every single state produces wine. And much to our surprise, at 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, we were biking along a pretty rural road and there was a sign that said winery, which prompted a quick left turn with myself, my wife, and, and two friends and into the winery. And, and we came upon this extraordinary wine, uh, uh, Pelkey's and Hogan's of Vermont. It's a country blue semi-dry. And, and you'll see here it says award winner. So uh, we know it was a good wine. Now, uh, it says a blueberry wine. Um, uh, it's absent of vintage, uh, which uh, is so extraordinary that they didn't want to date the wine. Uh, and here it sits unopened. I will tell you at that moment in time, after hours of biking, nothing tasted more delicious than that glass of blueberry wine. Uh, and afterwards, when the case that we had ordered and our enthusiasm showed up and we tasted it again, uh, we were very surprised to find out it did not have the same flavor. And so here it sits, uh, maybe a, a decade and a half later, still unopened. Uh, I'm waiting for the right occasion, and I believe it's going to be a cooking occasion when I need blueberry vinegar. Uh, I, I share that story because many of us came, came into wine uh, not from a position of expertise, but through hard study and and sharing information and learning from colleagues, our, uh, our knowledge ha has deepened. So uh, this is a reminder of where we've come from. Now, uh, you probably recognize this wine. Whoops. And uh, there's a slide that you can't see. But if you could see it, it, it would be a slide of the world and all of you. Uh, and where you come from. And uh, at this conference here, as in many of the prior conferences, we have people from all over the world. There are 16 countries 
that are uh, represented. Uh, I, I share this bottle uh, of wine and, and the story uh, in, in spirit of the community we build by, by working across our, uh, our geographical, regional, country, and cultural boundaries. Uh, a few years ago in our Executive Wine MBA program, we took a group of students to, uh, to Antonori. Um, uh, County Classico. They just opened the, the new facility there and we were pleased that we were going to get 10 minutes with uh, Marchese Piero Antonori. And for those of us in the wine business world, that's an honor to, to meet someone who's a father of Super Tuscan and uh, if I have the number right, 23rd in his family, 23rd generation to, to be producing, uh, producing wines. Uh, he didn't just spend 10 minutes with us, he spent two hours with us, regaling us of, of stories of his family's history and, and uh, the Italian wine market and global wine markets and how he thought of Super Tuscan and, and this blending of, of wines traditionally with two different countries together and this wonderful story of, of sharing. And in, in the spirit of someone genuinely hosting uh, us, uh, visiting them in their home, uh, I want to welcome you to, to our home. This story has a, a past, present, and, and future to it. The, the past is, uh, it's a winery, Hamill Family Wines, that one of our MBA alumni, wine MBA alumni, uh, uh, started. Yesterday at, at the pre-conference, we were talking about the challenge of setting expectations for students too high uh, in the wine industry, that many of them start out uh, not as the CEO of, of their own winery uh, on the, the pages of Wine Spectator and other publications. Uh, this is a story of someone actually uh, who did get to live the dream, uh, left the, the sort of grind of the financial uh, world, came to our program uh, with his family, started a, a winery. Uh, the president, that's the past, the president, uh, he currently serves as the GM of this winery and is uh, vice president of the board of our wine business institute. And the future is tonight where we'll be at Hamill Family Wines and uh, you'll, you'll get to see their winery and, and taste their wines and uh, it, it's representative of what we're all doing for our students, helping them live their dreams. And now finally, uh, we get to the stories of the bottles of wine in, in, in front of you. Uh, some of you have Sonoma State Cellars, and this is a wine from our Wine Business Institute. And you may have heard of our Wine Business Institute, uh, well, certainly through colleagues from the teaching that we do, the research, our involvement uh, in, the, in the industry. The most important thing about the Wine Business Institute, I think, is uh, it's not an institute, it's a, it's a community. And you, by being here and by inviting us to, uh, to your homes, uh, are part of that community. And so uh, by way of thank you and, and welcome, I'd have you raise your glass now. And as you do that, I want to point out this other bottle which says uh, Silver Family Wines. This is my, my wine, the very first vintage that I produced. Uh, you, you'll notice a mortar and pestle here. My family business was a pharmacy, a retail pharmacy. And uh, a couple years ago, my dad at the age of 80 finally decided to retire and not be one to, to sit idle. He was looking for something to do. So I invited him out here and said, let's make wine together. And uh, for those of you with the bottle, if you looked on the last, uh, on the back label, it says, uh, drink one to two glasses of 2015 Old Vines in PRN with family and friends. PRN is a uh, pharmacy prescription speak for, uh, for as needed. And so here we are at the beginning of a wine conference. Uh, it is a little uh, uh, close to nine in the morning our time, but some of you are coming from other countries where it is well past uh, the time when we should have had a glass of wine. So uh, please raise your glass. And from us to you, welcome to our home. We're thrilled to have you here. Cheers. Looking forward to uh, spending time together and learning together. Cheers. Uh, you'll be pleased to know, although uh, I'm sure conference organizers are, are panicking because I'm taking us uh, behind schedule, that we've actually knocked off the first item uh, on the schedule. So uh, give yourselves a hand for uh, making, making progress. And uh, this is as good a time a as any. Uh, we'll, we'll do this typically at the end, but it's important to recognize at, at the beginning. Uh, you all know Liz Tosh and Janine Olson, and they have put in hours across uh, a year and a half in making this conference happen. And so for me to you, thank you so much for what you've done. We're real excited uh, to be here, and it wouldn't have happened without the two of you. 
And a, a special non-agenda treat for you. I'd like to invite up to say a couple words of, of welcome our, our new provost, uh, Lisa Bollendorf, who just started here a couple weeks ago and is trying to get her arms wrapped around the, the university. And I told her, well, the university starts with the Wine Business Institute. So uh, welcome, Lisa. Thank you. He did actually tell me that. It's true. So we say in, in our country, in English, we say it's five o'clock somewhere. I say it now, I'm on day 26 of the job, and I've said it every single day. It must be five o'clock somewhere, is there a drink available? And now I know where I could have been coming. It's wonderful to welcome you here to Sonoma State University. We are a liberal arts public university that serves around 10,000 students. And we are very proud to be a Hispanic serving institution, which means that one third of our students are of Latino origin, identify as Latinos. So one thing that I want to draw your attention to that the, uh, in terms of the role that we play here in Sonoma and Napa counties, and in terms of the broader region, is we're very proud to be creating a pipeline for the workforce, the, the future professionals of California. And in particular, this is why I think it's wonderful we have a Wine Business Institute. We serve a diverse student population, and we hope that the diverse student population will then become the future diverse workforce that will serve our regions, and in this case, an international business, with integrity and with pride and represent all the cultures that we have embedded in California and that you have embedded in all of the places you come from. I'm a language professor by training, so I have spent a lot of time in Spain, actually. It's where my research is. So I would love to spend the day with an international crowd. Unfortunately, I cannot. But I want to tell you that uh, you have come to a beautiful part of the world, and you're in good hands with our tr professionals of our Wine Business Institute and our School of Business and Econ. So without further ado, have a great day. Thank you. Am I emceeing this morning? Is that OK? <laughs> then uh, next, uh, I'd like to introduce the executive director of our Wine Business Institute, a man who needs no introduction in the wine community, uh, Ray Johnson. All right, Bill. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We, re we appreciate you coming from all over the world to visit us right here in our home, uh, the home of the Wine Business Institute. Let's go to the next slide. Hmm. Hit the arrow. Now. There you go. There we go. The arrow, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, yeah, visibility would be good, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Liz asked me to talk today about the Wine Spectator Learning Center. And, you know, a building isn't just a building. It's not concrete and windows and wood. It's about the people who make it happen, and it's about the people who it's going to serve. Uh, this is coming to life, uh, opening later this year with a big ribbon cutting, a grand gala next May. But how this got started was actually quite a long time ago. Gary Heck at Corbell, Corbell Champagne Cellars out in the Russian River Valley, he met with the president here at the university. And they talked about the need for succession planning. We had people here in the next generation who learned viticulture, they learned enology, and that was becoming more perfected. But the need that the industry felt was for the study of wine business. We want our children to learn about the business of wine, is what Gary told the president. So he, he teamed up with a leader in the Napa Valley, Walt Klenz, who was at Behringer at the time. And so he took these two powerful people who were well-connected, who had very well-established brands, and when they picked up the phone, they were able to marshal more people to get behind this idea. And from that, we've developed a pretty comprehensive program and curriculum uh, offering graduate programs, undergrad, and a number of certificate programs for the wine industry. And this is the group that's been guiding it. And if you traveled from afar, you, you may not recognize some of the faces, but the brands you'll know, Constellation, Brown Foreman, uh, Corbell, Wine.com, in the United States, Young's Market, uh, Duckhorn, uh, turn time wine brokerage. So we have people from throughout the value chain weighing in on where we're going. 
And one of the things that they said we need to think about is having a learning center where all this activity can take place. So that is the Wine Spectator Learning Center there, a rendering of it. You can see the construction underway. It's nice and noisy and dirty and lots of walls going up right now. It's, it's a delight to all of us who worked on it to see all that noise and activity now. Uh, you, those of you who've been involved in building projects know you've spent a lot of time in meetings planning before they actually pick up a hammer and now the hammers are flying and it's great to see. And I think the best way to show you this, uh, what is happening, is where we kicked off with the groundbreaking in the middle of last summer. We commissioned a short video of two minutes to tell the story of the donors who got behind the Wine Spectator Learning Center and the alumni, the three alumni vignettes that give you a sense of what people are doing out there in the industry as they utilize the degrees that they've earned here at Sonoma State. So let's come up and we'll, um, we'll start up the video. Go ahead, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. And thank you, everyone. and for keeping it short and keeping us back on, on schedule. I'd now like to welcome up uh, Larry Lockshin. Where's Larry? Oh, there you are, right in front. Uh, so uh, I know he doesn't typically affiliate with the Wine Business Institute, but I met Larry 10 years ago for, for the first time here. Uh, and and uh, he was telling me about all the great things he was doing um, in Australia where he works. And then uh, this winter, we were lucky enough to have him here uh, for a short time working with our students. So uh, welcome back for the second time this year. That's, that's my one slide, there we go. Um, thanks, and it's really great to be here. Probably, some of you I've seen for a few years, others um, new and welcome. This, was, this conference and this association was an idea that Tony Spotton and myself had back in um, 2002, and our first conference, a few people in this room remember that, a few sitting here in the front row at Sonoma State, um, 2003 in Adelaide, interestingly followed by Sonoma State two years later, and we had this conference a year and a half ago in Adelaide, followed by Sonoma State. So on a 10-year cycle, that seems to be how things are going. Um, and we've had 10 conferences since then, and the idea behind this and is to have my idea, and I think it's everyone's idea, which is, you know, I had the kind of a, it wasn't a vision, but just a 
tickling in the back of my head saying, I was pretty lonely working on wine marketing and wine business research in Australia. We have a wine industry, but there weren't many people to talk to. And I thought, well, how do you talk to each other? Get them together. So this whole organization was put together with the idea of interacting. It's purposely kept small. I hope everyone here meets everyone else because that's the whole idea. The dinner that we have tonight where you bring a wine from your own country, your own region, is all part of that getting to know each other. And it's a collegial, in, in all the senses of that word, association. Um, the case journal that Armin leads the team really came out of the groupings. It came out of his hard work, but it came out of organizing and thinking about people from around the world. And I think if you look at the conference program, you'll see many papers written by people from multiple countries written together. And those kinds of things are outcomes of meeting at this conference, thinking about ideas, and going back and then working together. So that, that was kind of the purpose of this. Um, it's organized kind of the way I organize things, very, very loosely. There's no fees, there's no board. I mean, you called me president, but there really is, <laughs> there's no organization except that every, year, every other year or so, a university hosts this conference and we get together. We have the Case Journal, the, uh, the um, International Journal of Wine Business Research. We actually talked about that journal when it was the International Journal of Wine Marketing at the Sonoma Conference. A bunch of us sat around a table and said, that's a journal that could be good. It wasn't very good then. We got together as a group and said, we'll be an editorial board. Several of us put our hands up. In those days, Ulrich Ort raised his hand to be the editor in the changeover. And now Johan Brewer, who unfortunately can't be here today, works in the School of Marketing where I am, is the current editor of that journal. It's going to come out this year, I think, or early next year with an impact factor. It's been all these years moving, moving up the ranks. And so what's the future? Well, the future is in a year and a half, and we'll hear more about it at the dinner, at the banquet. Um, this conference will be in Stellenbosch in South Africa, hosted by Nick Treblanche. So I think that's, that's a great thing. And then, the, and then a year and a half after that, Dijon will be going forward. But I'm going to say now and today that I think I will be saying goodbye as your grand puba, president, leader, whatever you want to call it, in Stellenbosch. And so we have about a year and a half to think about what the next stage will be. And again, I have this off the cuff few notes written down here. So I guess what I'd like to do if people here are interested in helping to form a small organizing committee for the future, just slip me your business card, write that on it so I know that's what it's for, and we'll get a email group working after the conference. Because it, it's an important association, the fact that it's fun we're all here because we like doing these things and we find like-minded people. And that was the whole purpose behind it. Not to be lonely in your office in a business school, in an economics department. Your interest is wine. No one else cares except to drink a bit. And this is where we can all get together and enjoy. And again, I thank our organizers, Bill and Ray, and of course, Janine and Liz, who put this conference together for us in Sonoma. Thanks very much. Thank you. I said to Larry, he was walking away, we'll, we'll miss him. You're not going to leave, you're just going to no, step, I'm okay. I'm going to be in charge of nothing, no. <laughs> uh, I'd now like to welcome up uh, Liz, who's going to tell us a little bit about the California wine region that we're in. All right, well, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, we've had a great time planning this conference, and I'd also like to recognize all of the other people who've helped us out. We have Jessica and Christine, we have a bunch of volunteers, the whole staff here, all the uh, conference coordinators, Sonoma State, our video people. There's just been so many people behind the scene that I want to make sure that they get credit as well. So let's give a round of applause to them. Okay, we get to talk about one of my favorite topics, and that's California, because I'm a fifth generation Californian, and that's sort of rare to have your family living in California for such a long time, and so it's something I'm proud of. And I have a question for you, show of hands, how many of you, this is your very first visit to California? Let's see, 
Ooh, looks about like 20 of you. Okay, how many very first visit to Napa, Sonoma? No more. Okay. Well, welcome to Napa, Sonoma. Welcome to California. So um, I wanted to let you know that it was in 1882 that my great-great-grandmother left Germany and came to San Francisco, the city by the bay, gateway to wine country. She opened a tavern on Shotwell Street. Uh, then in 1852, my great-great-grandfather came from Croatia, and he was one of the founders of Monterey. So that's how he ended up being a fifth generation Californian. And I mention that's rare because so many people are new here. They come here because this is the land of opportunity. This is the land of innovation. We have Silicon Valley. This is the land of movie stars. We have Hollywood. This is the land of dramatic scenery. We have places like Yellowstone. This is the state that produces the most uh, fruit uh, and um, nuts and other crops. And if California were its own country, we would be the fourth largest wine producing country in the world because California produces nearly 90% of the wine. But we have a bunch of great people here from Washington and Oregon and other states, so I wanted to give you guys a, a call out as well. But as you can tell, I'm slightly proud. And um, I know that not all of you have three months to tour the wine regions of California. So I'm going to show you a three-minute video that gives you a quick overview. OK, if I can start it. Let's see. And um, where's my video person? It's not starting. There we go. So this video was put together by the um, Wine Institute and uh, California Wines, and I think it's a really nice overview of all of California wine regions. California, the land of wine, food, and sunshine. It's no wonder they call this the Golden State. You might say Californians are serious about wine and relaxed about everything else. When you're surrounded by all this, it's pretty easy to smile. Our wonderful weather lasts all year long which is as good for our wine as it is for our visitors. 2,000 kilometers of rugged coastline expose nearby vineyards to natural air conditioning, while warm interior valleys and hillside vineyards get a fine mixture of cooling air and bright, unfiltered sun. Our soils are as diverse as our growing regions, so California's terroir is perfect for growing nearly any kind of grape find more than 100 varieties across the state. The North Coast is home to many of our most celebrated wineries. Here, the wine is as memorable as the scenery, with rolling hills, rocky cliffs, and towering redwood forests. Over the next 500 kilometers, the weather transitions from majestic and moody to pleasantly mild. Vines on California's central coast are among the state's oldest by Franciscan monks as they settled the area in the late 1700s. Southern California wineries with their quiet, tucked away vineyards share the sunshine of our famous beaches. Our sunny valleys in the east are great for grapes, but that isn't all that grows here. This region is one of the most fertile farmlands in the world. The Sierra foothills prove that beautiful views pair perfectly with a glass of wine. Yosemite National Park and Lake Tahoe offer up signature California scenery, while nearby vineyards serve up our signature Zinfandels. And of course, nothing pairs better with great wine than great food. California cuisine is diverse and delicious, the result of a vast array of fresh ingredients, cultural influences, and imaginative chefs. Imagination fuels innovation something California is famous for. Our pride, passion, and ingenuity have made our state a world leader in sustainable wine growing. Nearly 70% of our vineyard acreage is farmed in accordance with the grape to glass best practices of California's Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance. No matter what type of wine you like, California has a glass waiting for you. And if you can't be here in person, well, our sunshine is in the bottle. Okay, let me make sure I stop this. Let's see. Great, okay, so what I wanted to talk about next then is 
just a little bit more about um, the history and the background. So here's the, the map we just saw. Uh, you are in the northern part of California and the Napa Sonoma wine region, but you can see the other six regions that were on the video, and hopefully you'll have a chance to visit some of those in the future. But my question to you is, and I know this is a brilliant group, which country introduced wine grapes to California? Spain. Spain! Excellent! And it was in 1769 that the Spanish came into uh, San Diego at the Mission de San Diego and planted wine grapes. They planted the Mission grape, which was the Pais grape out of Spain. Um, and then they continued to, to, plant, uh, to um, plant more grapes all the way up to the coast uh, with their missions. And the last mission was actually in Sonoma County. So, um, um, but it wasn't actually the Spanish who brought the first grapes to Sonoma County. Does anybody know the answer to this? This is an obscure question. You're never going to guess who planted the first grapes in Sonoma County. It was the Russians. Yes. The Russians actually, in 1812, put, uh, set up a fort called Fort Ross on the coast of Sonoma for fur trapping and trading, and they planted some grapes. They planted a small vineyard out there. It was a few years later, though, that the Spanish arrived, 1823, and planted vineyards at Sonoma Mission. And then right after that, in 1838, George Yaunt arrived in Napa Valley. He actually was there as a bear hunter. He was hunting bear. And he thought, what an amazing place. I'm going to stay here and plant wine grapes. And he did. He planted over 200 different varieties, and the town of Yauntville is named in honor of him. So when George and everybody else first arrived in Sonoma County, this is what it looked like, Sonoma and Napa. It was filled with native grasses. In fact, they said there was, the grasses were so lush and so high here, they called it the wild oats of Eden. And the Native Americans were the first settlers here, the Wapo, the Miwok, the Pomo tribes. And they are still here. And they are. Uh, they have their own nations, and they have some beautiful casinos they've built. If you have time, there's one in Roner Park. And I'm proud to say that here at Sonoma State, the president of our student wine club is a Native American. And she told me her dream is to someday start a winery here in Sonoma County. So we're hoping that's going to happen for her. But um, these wild grasses, as you can see, they're still around. In fact, look at this picture. That's in Napa Valley. That was a couple weeks ago. If you look closely, you'll see Hervé here. This was when the Kedge uh, Sonoma a state group, uh, we were doing a, a wine MBA program together, and they came over and we went to Napa Valley. So the wild grasses are still around. Um, so Napa and Sonoma counties today, you did receive a, a map, but I wanted to show you this because it shows you how close they are. We hug each other, we don't compete, we need each other, and we support each other, and we're quite different. And Sonoma State is right in the middle, and that's because we have students from both of these counties, plus of course Mendocino and Lake and all over California and indeed all over the world. And the Pacific Ocean is right out along the Sonoma coast, and um, we now have over a thousand wineries between both valleys, 16 AVAs in each valley. What's an AVA? American Viticulture Area, which is the Appalachian for, uh, for America. And, uh, but however, we only produce about 10% of the wine. Sonoma produces 6%, Napa of 4%. But we get millions of tourists each year. If you ask people around the world um, what is the most famous region, uh, wine region of America, they usually say Napa first, Sonoma second. We just put them together, Napa, Sonoma, Napa, Sonoma, Sonoma, Napa. <laughs> um, and we each get a huge amount of revenues from a wine tourists. Uh, 2016, Sonoma, $1.93 billion, Napa, $1.9 billion, and that's pretty much average every year. So it's a huge industry here. Um, I wanted to also talk a little bit about why this is such a famous region in terms of the terroir. We do have an ideal place for, for grapes. Napa has a saying that this is Eden. This is Eden for a wine grape. Uh, we have the perfect uh, Mediterranean climate, warm and sunny in the, in the um, summer times and wet in the winter. We get a lot of rain in the winter. Um, our soils are wonderful, a lot of volcanic rock, alluvial fans, old riverbeds, uh, seabeds, and clay and loam and sand. 
Um, we have from sea level to uh, 2,600 feet in elevation where the vines are. And most important, we have these protective bodies of water that are such an important influence, uh, influence on the vines. We have the Pacific Ocean, and then of course we have San Pablo Bay and, and the many rivers. Like you'll see the Russian River uh, if you're coming. Well, we'll see it as we uh, head up on um, Thursday night. Um, so the main thing that makes this so special is the gift of the fog. You saw the fog this morning when you woke up. The skies are white. It's nice and cool. You can sleep here easily because we have our natural air conditioning. But what this fog does is it starts piling up out on the Pacific Ocean around 3 o'clock every afternoon. There are some days it doesn't, but usually it does. It did yesterday. It did the day before. And then it slowly starts moving in, and around 6 o'clock you can actually see it piled up on the mountains on the west like wet white whipped cream. It's so pretty. And then it slowly starts rolling in. And 9 o'clock, we're almost covered. And during the night, we usually have this nice soothing blanket of fog. And as you can see, it actually goes over into Napa Valley. <clears throat> but it's mainly on Sonoma. And uh, by 9 o'clock in the morning, it starts to, to move back. So by the time lunch rolls around, we should have sun again. And it gets nice and warm. Um, and so <clears throat> this fog is so important for wine grapes because it helps preserve the acidity. It helps them have a longer ripening time so they can have the full flavors and phenolic ripeness they need. And that's why this is such an incredible place for wine grapes. And you'll notice when we compare our mean temperatures in Napa and Sonoma to uh, Bordeaux and Burgundy, they're quite similar. Burgundy, of course, is the bottom line there. It's uh, cooler. Um, but as you can see, it, in the summertime, Sonoma, or Russian River, is actually cooler than Burgundy. Um, and then Napa and Bordeaux, of course, are warmer. And so because of this, when we look at the grapes, Sonoma is best known for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, more cooler climate grapes that need the fog, whereas Napa is better known for Cabernet Sauvignon and Sauvignon Blanc, a warmer, uh, more, uh, grapes that love the sun a little more. Um, and however, both counties are very famous for Zinfandel. You'll find century old vines in both, um, both counties. So we had a little bit of a Zinfandel this morning. We're going to be having some more on Thursday night at the gala. And so, um, and you'll be having some really great Pinot and Chard tonight at the other dinner. And of course, you'll be bringing your wines from around the world. I did want to pause for a minute and say we're trying to celebrate the, the uh, in honor the the heritage of California. So tonight's dinner is in honor of the Latino population. We're having Mexican food. I know many of you love Mexican food. And it's going to be great paired with your wines from all over the world. And then uh, the next night, we're honoring sort of the, the movie star and the ranch heritage um, with the, the gala dinner out at Francis Ford Coppola. Um, so I just wanted to end with our focus on sustainability. This is super important in California. Uh, both Napa and Sonoma focus on it. And if you can see this chart, this is um, Sonoma County. Only 6% of Sonoma County is planted to vineyards. Um, as you can see, we have a lot of pasture and forest. We try to keep the land as preserved and native as possible. Napa does the same. They're only 4% uh, vineyards. and. Um, you can see all the different certifications. We're using Napa Green, California Sustainable Wine Growing, Fish Friendly Farming, lots of different certifications. And indeed, we have set a goal in both counties to be 100% sustainable in our vineyards, all certified by 2019. And we've made a lot of progress. As of the end of last year, Sonoma County now is 60% of our vineyards are certified by third party audit at Napa at 50%. And we definitely believe we're going to achieve our 100% goal by 2019. So I'd like to end with this beautiful a photo. This is an old vine, California Zinfandel. They're just amazing to look at. And uh, I just want to say again, welcome and enjoy your time in California. Come on, Jeannie, you're going to need the pleasure at least of introducing you. So uh, remember all those uh, emails you were getting about get your reviews in and, and this organization of, OK, how about we put these together? And all this happened because of uh, Janine's hard work. So we're pleased to welcome her this morning. Tell us what we're supposed to do. Thank you. And welcome, welcome to Sonoma State University and welcome to California. We're going to have an exciting program for you over the next two days. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of information on how things are going to be organized. The rooms where the presentations will take place are going to be in this building on the second floor. So when you leave the ballroom, if you go down the stairs one flight and then turn immediately to your left, 
and immediately to your left, you'll see the valley rooms. The presentations and the coffee breaks will all be in the valley rooms. So they're right there together. And we invite you that if you want to change uh, uh, rooms during the sessions, please feel free to wander and go to the rooms that have the presentations you are most interested in. Um, the session chair, I uh, appreciate everyone that volunteered to be a chair for the sessions. Their role during the presentations will be to introduce the presenters and to make sure that everyone stays on time so that we can meet for lunch back here at 12.30. So lunch will be in this room again. I do want to remind everyone that there's only 45 minutes for lunch. So we encourage you after the uh, presentations downstairs to make your way up here as quickly as possible. If you need to use the restroom, the restrooms are on the second floor. If you go out of the valley rooms and turn immediately to your walk, right and then continue on into the middle of the building you'll see a stairwell and the bathrooms are on the right um, uh, turn right the bathrooms are there uh, adjacent to the stairwell let's see um, sorry um, uh, okay, so after the presentations end today at 4 o'clock, the bus will be waiting for us downstairs where they dropped us off. So we encourage everyone to make the way to the bus as quickly as possible. Once you get to the bus downstairs, we'll leave to return to the Hyatt, and you'll have a little bit of time to get ready for our uh, dinner this evening. The buses for the dinner this evening will start to board at 5.45, and I just remind everyone that we do need to be on the bus to go to the dinner. The winery doesn't have the room for parking or fire. They can't have to keep the roads free. So they don't have a place to have private vehicles on their property. So to go to the dinner tonight, you do have to be at the Hyatt to board the bus starting at 4, 5.45. We hope to leave immediately, immediately at 6 o'clock. I know that many of you are not staying at the Hyatt Hotel, and so I just want to remind you that if you're going to be driving, that you'll be hitting the roads during rush hour. There could be a lot of traffic. So to make sure you give yourself plenty of time to get to the Hyatt by 545. Uh, tonight's dinner, as you heard, things can start to chill down a little quickly. So I encourage you to bring a sweater or a jacket in case it starts to get a little cool. If you don't have one, on the second floor of this building, if you walk to your right, you'll see our university store where you can purchase the always appropriate Sonoma State hoodie to bring to the dinners tonight. Oh. Let's see. And so uh, tomorrow morning, the buses will leave from the Hyatt at the same time. We'll start to board at 7.45 so we can roll out at 8 o'clock. And then at lunch, we'll have more information about the logistics tomorrow. So that's the information I have. I also wanted to make note that in your program, you'll see that we have a social media hashtag. And during the conference, we encourage you to take photos and to use the hashtag. And so we can follow everybody's uh, uh, event experience on social media. So without further ado, that's my logistics. If you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, try to answer them the best I can. Please feel free to ask me, to ask Liz, or to Christine at the registration desk who will also be able to help us. The sessions now will begin with the presentations. We'll need a few minutes so that presenters can load their flash onto the computers downstairs. For those of you that are presenting uh, during the conference, either the breaks before if you can take a few minutes to load your presentations, then things should go a little bit quickly, more quickly during the session. So thank you very much and enjoy. I'm looking forward to the next few days of wine business research. Thank you. Thank you.